Hi, I'm Guy Lawrence and you are listening to the Guy Lawrence podcast. If you're enjoying this content and you want to find out more and join me and come further down the rabbit hole, make sure you head back to guylawrence.com.au. Awesome guys, enjoy the show. Paul, welcome to the podcast. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. I have to ask you this and I'm dying to know the answer. You travel a lot, probably. You're on an airplane. Yeah. I I got burned out doing that. (laughs) Well, if you were on an airplane and a stranger sat next to you and asked you what you did for a living, what would you say? It's happened many times. I tell them I'm a holistic health practitioner. Easy. Yeah. And then uh, depending on where where they're at, they'll probably start poking questions in, in all sorts of different directions. Usually what is that is the next question. Yeah, fair enough. Now, I, I'm here today and I've been, I've been itching to, I've been looking at your blog. I've been researching a lot of the, th- the content you put out there. And, and it blows my mind, honestly, Paul, that the depths of knowledge that you have and where you go with this, with this work. And it just seems to get deeper and deeper and deeper. <laughs> and, the more, and the more I learn myself, it just asks more questions and it just keeps going. And it's quite incredible. So, it's, so well, thank you. The stuff I share with the public's just the tip of the iceberg. It, you know, it takes about seven years to complete my training. And when you get to, you know, courses like check level four, where we do a very deep dive into the psyche or check level three, where we do the entire totem pole and I show how the control systems of the body work and why you have to assess the body in a very specific order, or you'll always be tra- chasing symptoms. It's far, far deeper. Unfortunately for me, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword because many business analysts have looked at my work and said, you give so much away, people actually think they know what you really do by just watching videos and stuff like that. But it, it's deceptive because what you actually teach is far deeper than that. But, you know, I feel a social obligation. It's kind of my way of doing community work to share the things that I feel at least if I give the stuff I give that people have a chance of getting healthy because there's so damn much misinformation out there and just lousy information and so many pseudo experts. Yeah. I just, it's kind of my way of um, putting bir- bird seed in the bird feeder, you know, and I figure the right people will find it because people won't do anything to heal until they're ready. So, you know, like many, many people have said, geez, why don't you have a lot more viewers than this? You know, you should have so much more views with the quality of this material. I often tell them because my work's not fluffy, you know, take a pill, be, do magic. It's, you really have to participate. So I'm glad you enjoy it. And uh, like I was saying, it's far deeper than that. I'm really only just putting sound bites out there. Yeah, no, I can, I can relate, mate. I can relate. And I wanted to mention earlier on, because you were on my wife's podcast, um, a couple, I think it was a couple of months back, Linda Gripridge, Love and Guts. Yeah. You mentioned a book, and I've got it here, Stalk in the Wild Pendulum by Itzhak Bentov. Is that probably yes. the best way yeah. to Itzhak Bentov, yes. And, uh, and you recommended on the show, and, and when I heard the interview, I was like, I've got to ch- check that out. And, um, and it's amazing. It's an absolutely amazing book. And it's on the mechanics of consciousness, which is yes. a topic that fascinates me. Mm. And the question I have for you, I guess, is, is being a holistic health practitioner, or, or like, you know, that's the broad umbrella term for, to, for many things. But where did it start for you to start actually looking at this kind of work with consciousness? Was it, was it a shift or a specific event or something? Or did it just come naturally? Gradually. Well, my mother became a yogi. She was a Christian scientist, but then she joined the Self-Realization Fellowship when I was 12. So when I started going to the Sunday meetings, they were all run by the monks. And they were, you know, meditation was part of every service. They taught us meditation. And the monks, unlike going to a Christian science church or any Christian church I've experienced or and know anybody that I know of that's gone. They can't get their questions answered. And if they do, it's almost always something to do with hell and damnation and fear and what God wants or expects from you, but it never gets into any depth of, you know, good explanations. It's mostly just dogma. But 
so by the time I w was 12, I had a lot of questions, you know, questions like how could God love you, but burn you in hell for touching your genitals or making a mistake. And how could, uh, how could it be that you have to take Jesus as your savior or you'll burn in hell. And there's billions of people that don't even know who Jesus is mm -hmm. and things like that. So when I started having access to monks and I could ask questions, I got great answers. And then through my childhood meditation experiences, I found myself one having visions, which was quite wild for me. I would, I would have, visions and it would feel for example like i was in another place or you know maybe another dimension of reality like a waking dream but it was as real as when i was awake kind of you know with my eyes open walking around and so um then when i was 15 i went to summer camp with the monks so i got to spend a lot more time with them and learning more techniques and a asking more questions and then as I was doing my research and development and seeing the science out there and, and you know, various scientists discussing what consciousness was, a lot of the things they were saying didn't match the experiences that I was already having. And when I was 12, due to a tremendous amount of stress in my life, I started having very profound out of body experiences. And at first it scared the hell out of me. I thought there was something wrong with me, but then I realized, well, if, if this can happen, maybe if I just stay focused and try to work with it, I, I, I could learn to control it. And with, with, within a couple of weeks, I was able to actually leave my body and go all over the place on the farm Wow. And I thought, well, I have to figure out if I'm actually hallucinating or if this is real. So I started, we had a 140 acre farm and, and, you know, a big woolen factory. And so there's tools all over the place. And because a lot of uh, wild dogs and animals would come attack our sheep, we had loaded weapons in pretty much every corner of every building so that we could kill whatever was trying to kill the sheep. So I would leave my body and I would go look around on the farm, see what I could identify. Then in the morning when I went to do my chores, I'd go see if it was actually there. And I proved to myself over and over again, I'm actually somehow able to leave my body and carry my consciousness anywhere. And later I learned that that was called remote viewing. And so in 2000, I believe it was 2000, 2001, I, I went to the field conference put on by Lynn McTaggart. And um, th there was a, a remote viewing training course there run by the director of the CIA's remote viewing program. And I just felt very like I intuitively sensed I needed to go there because I already had the sense that I could remote view. Long story made short, they had a contest at the end. There were 750 people there in this class. And at the end, they had a contest and I won the contest. And it really freaked out two of my instructors because they'd been training with me for years and didn't know I had these abilities. And um, so through all my research and dealing with people's problems and, and you know, head traumas and from a medical perspective, I, I wanted to look into, you know, what is post-traumatic stress disorder? What causes brain injuries? What happens to the brain? And I kept seeing, you know, piles of information suggesting that consciousness was created by the brain. But I always had this question, well, if that's true, how is it that I can actually leave my body and go anywhere I want to go? If I want to go to the moon, I can get there as quick as I can focus on it and be there. If I want to go to the sun, I can do it. And I spent years traveling all over to the moon, to the sun and, and many dimensions. My soul would take me to these other dimensions and I would work with people there. So I found that the so-called scientific materialistic view of consciousness was, was very, well, I just have to say wrong. It's kind of like somebody that's never had sex writing a bunch of books about sex and uh, typical intellectual silliness you know Jung says 
intellectualism is a common cover-up for fear of direct experience. And I found that to be just exceedingly true. So I just kept, because it was so, because consciousness is so foundational and so pivotal to human life, I researched and researched and one book would lead me to others or one expert would lead me to others. And I studied research into Psy and, and you know, watched m mountains of Jeffrey Mif Mishlove's uh, thinking aloud shows where, cause he's a, a PhD in, in, okay. in Psy research. And I have literally hundreds and hundreds of books on everything to do with the soul, with God. I mean, I've probably got four or 5,000. I've got a, a house full yeah. of books, a whole library. Before I moved here, I had an 1800 square foot library of nothing but bookshelves, all catalog. That was my research library. So between being able to access the monks and then, you know, the other thing is, is it's one thing to hear it from a monk, but then I have to say, well, I can't just say I learned that from a monk. People won't believe me. So then I would go look into this stuff. And as everything, you find people diametrically opposed. Well, you, you come across a guy like Itzhak Bentov. When I first came across that book many years ago, I mean, I, I don't know how long ago that I read that book, probably in the, you know, maybe 95, 96 or something like that. Um, I went, now this is the real deal. Hmm. Here's a scientist who's also a very advanced meditator and a remote viewer. In fact, Itzhak Bentov had a friend that worked for NASA, and this is before they knew what the rings of Saturn were made of. And so his friend had told them they were trying to figure it out. And he said, I, I, I can tell you what they are because I've been there. He said, it's, it's rocks and chunks of debris that have collected in the orbital field of the planet. And the guy went back and told people at NASA and they kind of just laughed at him. But when the first space probe came back with pictures, it was exactly what Bentov had told them. So yeah. it was through these experiences. I just kept going deeper and deeper. And then I was always interested, how does the research correlate to what I experience? And so I was always kind of looking, what is the research saying? What do I experience? And if I found different ideas in the research, then it gave me a way to go inside and see what I could figure out. So, you know, sorry for the long winded answer, but that's how uh, I got it's, into it. It's insane. It's incredibly powerful. A couple of people sprung to mind because I've had Lynn McTaggart on my show, actually. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, she's just an amazing woman. Um, mm -hmm. And it's... It, have you heard of um, Dr. Eben Alexander? Have you looked at yes. his book? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've listened to some interviews with him. I've, I think I have his book somewhere, but I might have listened to his book on audio. It's been a while, but yeah, I know uh, who he is and I know his story. And I've studied extensive stuff with Ray Moody and, and uh, many, many, many uh, books and documentaries on life after death and reincarnation research. And as you know, reincarnation is fairly traditional in the Eastern philosophy and, and the monks uh, talk about that quite extensively. And, th and that's another topic. There's a lot of confusion on in, in religions. Even Buddhism is confused about that. It's mad. When you, um, so like when you have experiences like that, and like you say, nobody can take those experiences away from you. Once you, once they're real to you, they're, they're real, you know? And, yeah. And, well, what do you think that does for you in terms of, living life on earth you have you know because it must affect the way you make decisions and the way you go about things and fear must evaporate surely in a lot of areas that we can live with yeah well you know um in 2006 i did uh a year of training with a physician that used uh, that uses psychedelics as part of his healing therapy for people and so Prior to that, I had also uh, worked with a master of Tai Chi and Qigong. So I took my meditation training from Self-Realization Fellowship. And I'd already, you know, as soon as I learned I could remote view, automatically it told me, well, look, I'm able to go places, look at things, walk. Do, you know, I, my consciousness is there. My sense of my body is there, but I'm in a light body. For example, if I look at my hand, it's made of light. It's not made of, of physical stuff. So I'd already, from an early age, begin meditating on this and realized 
there's no way that I can go do these things if I'm only my body. So the first thing that, that happened to me is I realized death is not death of consciousness. Death is not death of the sense of self. Death is merely the loss of your physical body. And I've studied Rudolf Steiner's work extensively. I've got about 170 of his books written either by him or initiates of Steiner. And Steiner's got extensive teachings on what happens when you die and just like the Buddhists do and other traditions do. But I basically realized that most of the people that had all these opinions about what happens when you die were very undeveloped and they were just usually cut and pasting other people's opinions. So they're just, you know, programmed robots. Um, but what it did for me is it took away a lot of the kind of background unconscious stress. I think, you know, our, our, there's two, the two main fears people have based on research is public speaking and dying. Yeah. So the two things people are the most afraid of is having to speak in public and die. I was never afraid to speak in public. I've always had that in me. Um, but I also had some profound God experiences when I was a child that helped me realize that what God was was not what people thought God was. And due to my meditations on God and, and through my soul, it became very clear to me that if God can't die, then nothing can die because God is the prime source from which all emerges and, you know, the first principle of Sufism is there is no God but God. I worship everything and everyone. So if everything is God, then basically everything's just in some form of uh, energy and information expressing itself. And even physics says energy cannot be destroyed, only transformed. Mm -hmm. So really what happened to me at a core level is I realized I'm here as an agent of consciousness so that God can experience itself in this unique way that I call myself. And just like who guy is, is another novel expression of the divine experiencing itself and life through that unique perspective. And I came to the realization that every living creature on earth or in the universe is like a neuron in the mind of the universe, which is the mind and body of God. And, and when you come to that authentic realization, not intellectual, yeah. then you realize that, one, what we call life is an eternal process, and that there, it takes the background fear away. I mean, when you really, if you could really measure how much of people's beliefs and behaviors are oriented around trying to avoid anything that could potentially kill them, it's a huge, huge amount of people's unconscious stresses or conscious stressors, especially as they age. So it left me in a position of feeling much more at ease in myself and much more uh, willing to truly express myself and, you know, live fully through whatever I was doing, racing stock cars, racing motorcycles, you know, I was a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division, which is certainly a dangerous hobby. Wow. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been face to face with death many times. And uh, so I think what it did is it just, it left me in a place of feeling I am here to live fully. And when I'm done living fully, I will have no problem with dying because the problem for most people is they haven't lived when it's time to die. It's, you know, so I, 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 I live in this sense of knowing that my experiences are God's experiences. And when I use God, I'm not talking about some old man in the sky. I'm talking about consciousness itself, not consciousness like my consciousness or your consciousness. And that's where consciousness research is completely backwards. That's conscious of you are conscious of me and I am conscious of you right now because we're in a relationship, but it's consciousness itself that allows us to have a carrier 
for the waveforms of energy and information that we interpret as conscious of. So death is really merging back into the ocean of consciousness. In fact, Rumi says, you are not a drop of the ocean. You are the ocean in a drop. That says it all. <laughs> we screw the scientific researchers. Just go read Rumi and you're okay. <laughs> Uh, it's incredible. I, I often think, and um, I'm a nerve ending, sending information back. Exactly. That's, that's You're a I'm neuron. Like. Yeah. Right? The, the nerve ending has to have a neuron attached to it, or what, how can it communicate, right? Exactly. All living things, from single-celled organisms are, or, or, to human beings, to whales and dolphins and whatever there is, are actually neurons. And what you find out through these deep experiences and Nitzhak Bentov's book give you plenty of reason to realize that um, all of his books is even in the afterlife. I've worked with many people in the afterlife. I've been helping people with crisis of that, this type or that mm -hmm. type. And one of their loved ones comes to say, tell them not to worry or gives me information I could never know. And it freaks them right out because there, there's no way I could know the things. And so what, what you realize is that, you know, photons, which scientifically have an almost pretty much an infinite capacity to carry information, are also neurons. And really, what are we? We're just a bundle of light entangled. That's what E equals MC squared basically tells us. And, and you know, you're, an atom is 99.999 to the like sixth decimal point empty. So really, we're just light spinning around an invisible center called a zero point, which if you study Nassim Harriman's work, each atom has a black hole in the center of it. Yeah. You know, if you study the physics of love, you know, you'll, you'll, without going through a long expose, basically, God is dreaming itself into existence. And the dream is so real, we can't tell the difference. And the beautiful, you know, if you look at this from a sort of a Taoist perspective, perspective Chang Su said, if man can dream he's a butterfly, what makes you think a butterfly can't dream he's a man? Well, that kind of sums it right up. <laughs> mm. I, yeah, you know, you, and I keep thinking about from my own experience, because once you have experiences, you can, like I've had some experiences, Paul, that nobody can take that away from me and it changed the game for me yeah right? it changes the game as simple mm -hmm. as that and and then once that happens it i could i could then start to feel almost empathy and compassion for other people that are that are in a place that haven't got this i guess connection or this in yeah. that i believe is is almost like a gift and you've worked with so many people so many yeah. people what have you found? Because people could be listening to this today going, what the hell are these guys talking about? Or, or where is this at? Or like, what have you found has helped lead people into this work more? Do they have to want to do it? Is it a curiosity or is it pain? Or is it a bit of, bit of everything to people? Well, you know, I can answer that question for you lots of ways. Um, but if you look at the history of evolution on earth, well, there was a time when there was nothing here but water and minerals, right? Yeah. In the beginning. And from there, somehow, the energy and information, the energy and the information progressively made itself more and more complex. And so you have single-celled organisms that move away from threats and move toward food or pleasure as a basic drive for survival. And then you see around the time that jellyfish emerged, that was the first time we saw nervous systems emerging in nature, which I don't know, what, you know how many million years ago. That was 200 million years ago or more. I can't remember the exact details. But then you see as the creatures in nature got more and more complex and developed more and more complex nervous systems, they were able to perceive and experience more and more. And so human beings, if you look at the, if you look at a book on embryology, you can actually see there's stages in the, in the development of the 
neonate in the womb where it looks identical to a seahorse and then it looks identical to a chicken and it looks identical. So you actually can see in utero that we're recapitulating all these stages of development that happened on earth. And so the model of development stays in the human genome and we just keep building more and more complex creatures. And so how that relates to what you're talking about is that people develop psychically from, we started off with minerals and water. So they start off at a very, very materialistic level of consciousness with what they can see and what they can touch and weigh and measure. So you have your kind of scientific materialist mindset. But, you know, so they, they, you look at scientists, for example, that say consciousness isn't necessary to figure out mathematical equations on what consciousness is. In other words, they're saying it's only information. It's not actually something substantial. But as Nassim Harriman says, they forget that they're the consciousness involved in the equation and quantum physics shows you that you can't go into any kind of scientific research with any bias about what you want. The double slit experiment mm -hmm. showed you if you're looking for particles, you get them. If you're looking for waves, you get waves and that you cannot separate the observer from the experiment. So what I'm sharing here is that we, just as our bodies came out of a mineral and water milu and progressively got more complex to the point that we had self-reflection, we also are in a cultural milu where we're enculturated into belief systems and until those belief systems create enough confusion and pain for us to say, wait a minute, I have to look deeper into this because believing what everybody tells me isn't setting me free. It's not making me feel connected. And pain, you know, pain is an absolutely necessary, um, a necessary uh, force because if we didn't have pain, we would just stay unconscious. I'm sure you've hurt yourself before doing something and you had to figure out how to get better. And so, you know, someone hurts their back. Well, all of a sudden now they find out, well, there's five lumbar vertebra and there's this thing called a sacrum and you got discs between them and dot, dot, dot. And all of a sudden now they're more conscious than they ever were about what a lumbar spine is. And so they start doing the exercises and then inevitably sometimes they don't work. And so then a woman says, geez, you know, I'm doing all these exercises and it's not working. So she goes to see a therapist or a check professional and they say, well, you've also got the symptoms of a bladder infection. Do you have burning with urination? Yes, I do. Have you ever noticed that when you're premenstrual, you have low back pain? Yes, I do quite frequently. In fact, my back hurts a lot worse when I'm premenstrual. That's because your uterus shares a neurological association with your low back region and your pelvic girdle. So then all this sudden they're more conscious that their back is not just their back. It's actually linked into the organs that share a sympathetic nerve supply. So then you start looking into people like I've worked with many patients that have had a hysterectomy, but they still have exactly the same symptoms and same pains, but their uterus is gone. And the doctor says it's all in your head. And I tell them you have an energy field. The Tibetan monks figured this out 900 years ago that the energy field formed very quickly within a very short period of time after the sperm met the egg and the entire energy field of the body and all the acupuncture meridians were in place and that guided the division of the cells so that the stem cells knew what to become. So all I'm showing you is that just the same way that pain can give us a reason to keep asking bigger questions and looking and looking, if you keep going, then you realize, well, as long as you believe you're in pain, you'll be in pain. And lo and behold, the placebo shows you just, the placebo research shows you just that. So the next thing you know, well, God, my mind can actually make my body hurt. It can make my posture change, my facial expression pain change. It can change my attitude. Attitude determines altitude. So then you have to start saying, well, what the hell is the mind? And then you get all sorts of confusing, conflicting answers. And... So what do you find out? Well, if you look at Dr. Siegel's work, mind is an embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy and information.
So you find out that mind is actually a field of information. Well, so what happens is everything links back to consciousness. Because what is consciousness? Well, Itzhak Bentos says consciousness is the total information ca carrying capacity of any system. Well, what's the largest system? <laughs> God, <laughs> the universe, <laughs> the multiverse, whatever it is, something's creating all this stuff and it's created in a field of action. And then you find Einstein who said the field is the sole governing agency of the particle. What is a field? By scientific definition, it's a place of action. So, you know, without going deeper and deeper, do, do you see that you, if you start just paying attention, you'll see that people start off at the level of their social programming, but the programming by nature always brings them to situations where the socially contrived answers do not bring freedom or alleviation of pain. And so they have to dig deeper. And every time they honestly go on their own hero's journey, and instead of listening to everybody with white jackets and PhDs and MDs take responsibility for looking themselves, they end up in mysticism. Yeah. <laughs> and if you go deep enough <laughs> into science, they say, look, uh, John Archer, Archibald Wheeler, one of the most famous quantum physicists that ever lived, made a very profound statement one time. And I've got it in one of my books with him in it. He said, any day now at the end of one of my mathematical equations, I expect to find a Rishi sitting there. Well, a Rishi is a wise man or a sage. And what he meant was, I keep finding in scientific investigations the exact same answers that the Lao Tzu's, the Chang Tzu's, the Buddha's, etc. gave us. So really, we're trying to use an objective tool to measure that which is subjective. And even the person doing the measuring seems to overlook the fact that, yes, two plus two equals four, but what's looking at it and counting cannot be counted. <laughs> this is why Einstein said, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it, it, like, it all tracks back to the same thing, doesn't it? Like you say, no matter what breadcrumbs you follow, it all leads back to source. Well, it all leads back to who's looking because thought still is a flow of energy and information. So thought itself is energy and information. And this is why I said, consciousness of, if you're conscious of the thoughts you're having or the words you want to say to me, you're only conscious of the flow of energy and information. So the way I describe this to people is think of consciousness like a dance floor. The dance floor doesn't do a damn thing, but it knows about every single foot that's touching it. It knows everything about the dance because it's all emergent from the dance floor. Okay. So the dance floor isn't doing anything but creating a backdrop upon which movement or the flow of energy and information can be perceived. The flow of energy and information is what we call mind. But what it's flowing from and to is consciousness in caps. So mathematically, consciousness is a zero. Everything else is a one or a combination of zeros and ones. Zero is the vertical dimension. One is the horizontal dimension of past, present, and future. But when you're in a deep meditative state or when I'm doing remote viewing, I go out of the one dimension of horizontal into the vertical dimension, which means I enter into the field out of which all possibilities emerge. And a shaman is someone who knows how to climb the ladder or the strata of consciousness because those things all interpenetrate the horizontal dimension. And that's one of the meanings of the cross. The vertical dimension means the subtle, the intangible, or the imaginary. Or Carl Jung would say, the psyche is not imaginary, it's imaginal. Something that we think something that's imaginary isn't real, but something that's imaginal means it's imagining as an image or an experience 
And everything that we do is based on our own inner perception. And there's nothing more real than your inner perception, which is why people have wet dreams. They have dreams that are so real that they orgasm. They can have dreams that are so scary, they actually can't tell the difference between whether they're alive in the dream or they're alive here which is exactly why Chang Su said, if man, if a butterfly, if, a, if man can dream he's a butterfly, what, you, uh, what makes you think a butterfly can't dream he's a man? Because when you're in the imaginal realm, nothing is more or less real than anything else. So ultimately, if you take a dot and put it in the center of an equidistant cross, the dot represents the zero point. Everything on the vertical axis is imaginal or it is the possibilities that are accessible in the field of mind. And when there's enough energy and focus, it becomes um, tangible in the physical realm. For example, if somebody, if you look at psychoneuroimmunology, there's mountains of research showing if someone keeps thinking that they have a broken heart, they're likely to manifest a heart disease. If you keep saying so-and-so is a pain in the ass, you're likely to manifest a rectal cancer because we actually take energy and information and put it into formation. We take the subtle imaginal and we build cells around it. So our tumors and our gut problems are often the um, physical manifestations of our dominant thoughts, feelings, emotions, and beliefs. Which is huge. Well, that's what, that's all there is. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta, I gotta ask God, there's so many directions I could take this right now. And I'm processing everything you say as well, Paul, you mentioned shaman and, um, I saw a shaman for the, um, about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. I did an ayahuasca ceremony and, uh -huh. And I was, I prepared for it. Well, I spent a lot of time researching and understanding and, and actually, and I felt I, I learned just about as much about myself before I did the ceremony than actually having the ceremony itself, which, was, which was quite incredible. Um, but it, I think that was like a, a, a catalyst for me though, to start open me, opening me up in different ways to start then really start to have a deeper understanding of this work. And it yes. kind of helped me move towards navigating what I needed to look for because I've had an experience. So yes. then I was trying to find things that, that could reaffirm my experience that I had, which I think is what you spoke about at the beginning. Yes, that's exactly what happens with or without the drug. I mean, meditation can do that to you. Trauma can do that to you. I've been uh, knocked. I've been in a coma for two days in a motorcycle racing accident. Oh, wow. So, you know, there's a lot of ways we can get into those experiences, but psychedelic medicines just they basically break down the ego's filtration system so we are exposed to the flow of energy and information and you've got you know uh, physiology says we have about um, nine billion bits of information flowing through our sensory system per second but the ego selects between 10 and 100 that are based on its perception of what it needs to survive <laughs> Yeah. So our sensory systems are actually flowing at a rate of 9 billion bits of information a second. A typewritten page is about 1,000 bits. So you have an Encyclopedia Britannica flowing through you every second, but the ego only selects out 10 to 100 or about half a paragraph every second, which you then focus on in your conscious ego-driven reality. And research shows the ego is only about five to seven percent of our total consciousness and that's what we think is reality but the ego really should be called the unconscious because what we call unconscious is what's regulating 30 billion billion biochemical reactions a second digesting eliminating metabolizing keeping us breathing keeping our heart beating so we've kind of got our we're like, we're, we're upside down in our thinking, right? And what do you do when you take a psychedelic medicine like ayahuasca? The filtration system breaks down and you go down inside the flow of consciousness and all of a sudden you find there is a hell of a lot there. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> that I didn't even know existed, but, yeah. but within, even within myself. And that was the thing, you, 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 you carry this all your life unconsciously. Yes. 
And then you start waking up. Well, that's what it felt like. Right. (laughs) That's the answer to your question. Why do people have such a hard time with all this stuff? Because they haven't woken up yet. Why? I'll tell you why. Two reasons why. One, any true spiritual practice is a threat to the ego. The ego is a control freak. And any legitimate spiritual practice is a disillusion. It's a dissolving of the ego. So the ego thinks it's dying. So it resists all legitimate spiritual growth practices. You have to have real balls to dissolve that ego because you have to be willing to give up your illusion of control. So people are afraid to lose control because they think that loss of control automatically means something bad's going to happen. They forget just as much good can happen as bad. So there's, there's that issue. Um, I forgot. What was the, the question there? The question was about waking up and you said people. Yeah. So I forgot what my second one I was going to share with you is, but you know, the first thing that I really wanted to point out was that the, the, the ego resists control. Oh, the second one is the other one that's very profound and real. And as a therapist who studied this extensively, because I've been doing this for 35 years and helped countless thousands of people with serious health problems. Um, Consciousness comes at quite a price, and Steiner t- talked about this quite extensively. Most diseases are the byproduct of consciousness. You see, if you didn't know that your company was shutting down and you were going to be without a job, you wouldn't be worried about losing your job, and you wouldn't be scared that you not, might not have a pension. So if, if you get wind from maybe one of your buddies works in the accounting department and says, you know, I'm not supposed to tell anybody this, but this company is going to be shutting down in six months. And you've been working there for 20 years and you start telling yourself, oh my God, what else am I going to do? I don't have any other skills, you know? So you go into this self-driven fear. And the next thing you know, you've got a stomach ulcer, you can't digest, your sex drive's gone. So really what I'm sharing is when we're conscious of things, two things happen. One, The rest of our programming acts on our belief systems about what that means. And oftentimes because of the negative bias built into our mind, because in nature we had to focus on the things that might kill us. So the brain's actually wired to look for threats because in our developmental time in nature, you couldn't ignore a tiger or a poisonous snake, dot, dot, dot. So now what happens is when we become conscious of things, our negative bias always looks for the threat and to the degree that we believe that it's true without really knowing if it's true or not, we project that negative bias into the future. And all of a sudden we are now manifesting anxiety, high blood pressure, fear, digestive trouble. So when I look at what's causing people all their health problems, it's almost always a belief about something. And most of those beliefs are about things that haven't happened yet. Like my husband's cheating on me. I know he is. Do you have any physical evidence of that? No, but I just know he is. I'm going to lose my job or I might die. And the list is long, right? People worry because they're too immature to actually investigate things. (laughs) You know, and then it's what, how, and then the next question I'm sure for many people would be, how do you then handle that? Once some, once you become consciously aware of a situation, that's probably yeah. can start generating fear within yeah. you and then, and then worry. And then the next thing, you know, you ruminate in over these things day in, day out, week in, week out. It's like, then how do you interject and break that cycle for, for people initially as well? Well, I, de- I developed, I did developed a system because that's really what I have to teach people to help them heal. Pretty much all, all, aside from, you know, falling off your bicycle or falling off a ladder or getting hit in a car accident. Look, if you look at the research, 85% of all orthopedic disorders reported to doctors, orthopedic surgeons and general practitioners are idiopathic, which means the patient has no knowledge of how the pain got started. That's 85 out of every 100 people coming for help with some kind of back, neck, body pain does not know how it got started. Well, it gets started by 
um, unconscious uh, choices, unconscious behaviors, not knowing how to lift properly, over-exercising, under-exercising, eating incorrectly, dot, dot, dot. So the point I'm making is um, in order to help people heal, I had to give them a tool they could use to learn how to reprogram themselves or they just keep using the same beliefs that caused the problem. So you, now you're just in palliative care, which didn't interest me at all. Any idiot can do that to really help people heal. You got to get way past ultrasounding and pills and cutting shit out. You have to go into what's really causing it. So I developed a four step process. Step one is what is your dream? What do you love enough to change for? I tell people, if you have a big enough dream, you don't need a crisis. So first you have to identify what is it that I love enough to change for? So for example, someone, I, I track back a person's digestive trouble to fear that they're going to lose their job. And I say, okay, what is your dream? And they might say, well, my dream is to have financial abundance. I say, great. Does then I say, okay, that's your dream. Your fear is that I'm going to lose my job. So I call it the coin drill. I created something very simple and I actually have special coins that I had made up with a Tai Chi symbol on one side is yin, the other side is yang. And I say, okay, that thought, is that a negative or a positive relative to your dream? And everyone knows it's a negative. I say, well, if the negative exists, the positive must also exist. North can't exist without South. In can't exist without out. Up can't exist without down. So now that you know that you are, have this fear of losing your job, what must also exist as an equal possibility? Flip the coin over. And they could say, well, I'm not going to lose my job. That's a positive. And then I look at them and say, is that true? They say, well, I don't know. So I say, well, if you don't know and you can't buy into it fully, then go to the middle of the coin because the middle's not negative or positive. It represents potential. So then you say, I have the potential to lose my job. Good. So I say, well, what is it that you can say that's positive with regard to your dream of having abundance in your life and not having to worry about money? And then they might say, well, I have the potential to get another job or I, I'm, I can get another job. Very good. How do you feel when you think the thought, I can get another job? Good. I say, well, how do you feel when you think the thought, not only can I get another job, but I might be able to get a better job with more money and a better insurance policy. Oh, I feel fantastic. I said, well, there you go. If you're going to invest your energy into a thought, and research shows the instant you start thinking a thought that's emotionally charged, they actually now have fMRI images of the brain immediately developing neural networks to support that belief. And when the more emotion in there is, the faster the neural network forms and the more efficient it becomes. So that's what I call introducing them to the pain teacher. I said, the pain teacher comes to show you where you have a mind virus. So when you think the thought, oh my God, I'm going to lose my job, you say, thank you, dear pain teacher, for showing me where I have a mind virus. My dream is to have abundance and prosperity. You flip the coin, I have the potential to get even a better job, and I'm excited because if I lose my job, I'm just going to go trust the universe to guide me to the next company I'm supposed to work with, to be with people I can enjoy being around that share my values, and my life will even be better. And so when they start embodying that, lo and behold, that's exactly what happens. Brilliant. And then they, the first step to that is actually being consciously aware, though, that that's going on. And then yeah. they, they take the moment and then they intervene. Well, you know, often they're, often they're not consciously aware. They often come to me with their problems, but they don't think that has anything to do with that. They yeah. think, I just have a digestive trouble or my neck hurts or whatever. So then I show them how the chakra system works. And I say thoughts about losing your job have to do with safety and security. That's the root chakra. Mm -hmm. So we look at issues of safety and security. You know, your stomach is in the third chakra, which is the zone of who am I? And how do I use my personal power and self-will? So I say, look, you're using your personal power and self-will to manifest what you don't want. And you're 
your mind is God to your body. So whatever you think your body believes is real. So if what your thoughts are telling you is that you're afraid, your body reacts as though it's afraid, but the physiological systems are not designed to be in a fight or flight state for long periods of time because it will literally burn the body out. There's no time in nature that we were running for a lion from a lion for a year straight. <laughs> Lions can't run that long. Um, so what I do is use maps and models so they can see. And, you know, I do things like muscle testing. I say, I can prove it to you. Hold your arm out. Resist me. And they resist. I say, okay, that's what I call a baseline. Now I want you to think the thought, I'm weak. And resist me as hard as you can. And boom, they're weak as cheese. I don't care. I've done this with strong men with deltoids the size of volleyballs. And I can push them down with one <laughs> finger. And then I say, now I want you to hold the thought that you are abundant, you are prosperous, you are safe. And I, can't, I can swing off their arm, even off of little women. I can't push it down. I'd, I'd have to flip their whole body over. Then I show them another technique. I say, okay, let's just do a baseline muscle test. Empty your head. Resist me. That's how strong you are. Okay, good. Now what I want you to do is tell me your name and your age and then ask the question, is this true? So I would say, I'm Paul Check. I'm 57 years old. Is it true? I would test strong. And I say, now with as much conviction as you can muster, tell me your name and your age, but lie. Tell me that you're your mother's name. I'm Margaret Jane Spa, and I'm 76 years old. And try to believe it as hard as you can, and they go weak as hell no matter how hard they try. Why? Because telling a lie in nature always increases the likelihood that you're going to die. Because anytime you lie to somebody about where food is at or where threats are at, it increases the risk of all of you dying and we couldn't survive without each other in nature. So our nervous systems will not support a lie. And the more we lie to ourselves, consciously or unconsciously, the more fear we get in ourselves and the more we manifest fear reactions. And our physiology is fear-based, which means our adrenaline levels are high, our cortisol levels are high, our blood sugar management gets all screwed up. You know, you, we have three primary hormones we have to have to survive, insulin, adrenaline, and cortisol. And how you use your mind and the choices you make regulate those three hormones. And if you burn your adrenal glands out, you set yourself up for a lot of chronic problems. And if you don't manage your blood sugar, you screw yourself up. So to finish the four-step model, one, what is my dream? Two, what are the two polarities? Three, yeah. there's three choices you can make in relation to any person, place, or thing. The optimal, which is the one that's best for you and everybody involved. The suboptimal gives you instant gratification, but usually causes problems on your dream team. For example, the person who thinks I'm going to lose my job out of fear says, I'm going to go to the casino and I'm going to gamble my $10,000 in my savings account and hopefully I'll win $100,000 and I won't have to worry and so they lose their money and then they have to go home and tell their spouse, I don't have any, we don't have any money left. I was so afraid to lose my job. I gambled at trying to, you know, get rich quick. So the suboptimal always gives instant gratification in some way, but causes problems for everybody that's most important to the issue at hand. Three is do nothing. Do nothing has a few options. One, call a timeout if you're in a heated discussion and you're not able to stay connected to the person you're talking to because it's breaking down and it's going to get worse. Two, do nothing means don't make a choice until you have enough information to make a well-informed choice. Mm -hmm. So if someone's trying to sell you on a new job because you're afraid you're going to lose your job, but they're offering you half the salary that you were getting, and you still don't have objective evidence the company's going to shut down anyhow. Remember, it was an inside leak, and, it, and the, it, it, we don't know that's true. We've got six months left. Anything could happen. So you need to gather information. Don't buy the car, metaphorically, till you're sure it's the best deal in town. Three is empathy. I mean, uh, is apathy. And apathy is, the, is, is actually the functional opposite of love. If you... Uh, if you research shows that to hate somebody is still 
a higher form of connection than to be apathetic, which means to not care. So children raised by apathetic parents have a higher rate of disease and criminality than parents who abuse their kids because at least if you're abusing someone, you're showing them attention enough to hit them or to talk wow. to them. So if the worst choice we can make is to be apathetic. And today we have a lot of apathetic people. So what is your dream? What are the two polarities that you're working with, with your mind? What choices are you willing to make? And then you have four doctors. Doctor happiness is the effective use of your mind. Doctor diet is the effective use of diet. Doctor quiet is the effective use of rest. And doctor movement is putting your body or your emotions or your mind into effective movement. So it's dream affirmative. So I use that four step process to teach people how to reprogram themselves and then how to make choices about what is happy making for you that you're willing to do. How do you need to move your body, your emotions or your mind? So it's dream affirmative. What do you need to feed yourself physically, emotionally and mentally to be nourished at all three levels of your being? And how do you rest your body, your emotions, and your mind so that you're not burning yourself out with a bunch of stinking thinking or poor choices so you can be dream affirmative? And it took me, you know, probably 15, uh, maybe, yeah, 15 years to, to do enough research to synthesize a mountain of stuff down to those four steps. And I've helped countless people heal from all sorts of stuff just by using that model. Yeah, that's brilliant, Paul. Thank you for sharing that. That's really useful. Um, I'm aware of the time. and oh, I've got some questions. I'm good, as long as you're good. <laughs> yeah, I've got about 20 minutes. So, I got, okay. so a few questions I ask is, um, what's been a low point in your life, but has later turned out to be a blessing? Uh, well, the low point in my life was my childhood. My father left my mother when I was about three and and took off he was a competitive dancer and he took off with dance partners and he was a drag racer he was a wild guy and and my mother was you know struggling she had three kids by the time she was 18 she, her father disowned her kicked her out of the house her mother had died two years before that her sister died one year before that so she was totally alone and isolated she ended up marrying a man that was extremely physically emotionally and mentally abusive to me, my brother's sisters, her. She stayed married to him for 24 years. He was a very abusive, very dangerous man to be with. So by the time I was about 12, I, w I just really didn't even want to be alive. And that's when I started having these out-of-body experiences. Um, it was my soul showing me that there was more to life and, and to the world than what my 12-year-old mind could conceive of. So I found that I could go into other realities where I could have safety and um, more joy there. And so my childhood was so painful and I found human being uh, adults so irrational, like sitting in a Christian church. I'm like, none of this makes sense to me. How can you tell me that God is love and God's going to burn you in hell in the same sentence? And I actually was so scared that if adults were that stupid, I was really in trouble. And so uh, what happened was, is I left home when I was 16. But what I realized is that my father toughened me up for the world and he gave me an incredible worth, work ethic without which I've never, I would never have been able to do the mountains of work that I've had to do to build an entire institute and a worldwide organization. So it was like spirit put me through boot camp to experience just how tough life can be for people so I could see just how bad the pain can be and how much trauma there can be so I could have empathy and compassion for people that I would later be a therapist for. Yet I also learned from my father who was a very intelligent man and a very amazing builder and could make almost anything. He used to be a special effects man for Universal Studios. So he taught me that don't make excuses, get the job done, but be creative and use your skills and find people to teach you that know more than you. And my mother was very, very artistic. She's a sculptor, um, a craftswoman, um, 
uh, and has a lot of unique skills. So by the time I got into the military, I realized that I was a lot fitter and a lot tougher and a lot more creative than most of the people around me. And that my painful childhood had actually prepared me to accomplish what I came to this planet to do. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Um, mm-hmm. What does your morning routine look like? I usually get up at about five o'clock, take a cold shower, drive to work, usually get here around six. And then I go through a routine where I blow tobacco and herbs and I do a, a prayer sequence where I give thanks to the, uh, to the, to the north, to the south, to, to great spirit and the fire realms above mother earth and down below the spirits of the west spirits of the east um i connect and give thanks to all the great sages and saints and gurus that have guided me i blow smoke and my love into all my healing instruments my rattles my drums my tools i blow smoke to david bohm itzak bentov arthur m young rudolf steiner carl jung and all the great teachers and guides that work with me from the higher dimensions. Um, I give thanks to Gene Gebser for his research and consciousness. I have a Native American Indian headdress and I, and I also blow smoke to Houston Smith for all the love and he left in the world. I blow smoke to my headdress and thank all the great chiefs for their wisdom and for guiding me to help people. I blow smoke to my yearly mandala and thank Great Spirit for guiding me each year and each day. I blow smoke to my piece of art where I wrote down my formula for consciousness that soul taught me. Um, I give thanks. I have a Native American family matrix, which is a way to organize psychic energy where I have symbolized all the key instructors and employees in my institute. And I open my heart and send them all love and gratitude and thank them for working with me to create abundance and prosperity for each other in the world. And I blow smoke to Chief Joseph. Uh, I blow smoke to the Dalai Lama. I blow smoke to Mother Teresa, Paramahansa Yogananda. And then I have three um, healing dolls from, from the Native American tradition. One of them is a medicine man. The other one is the chief of ceremonies. The other one is Sunface who represents the consciousness of the sun. So I connect to them and blow my energy into those symbols. So I'm thanking the universe for giving me the spirit and the consciousness to help others heal and to help myself heal. I thank the universe for giving me the guidance that I need to be a good public leader. And I give father son thanks for his consciousness, wisdom, life, love, light, and warmth. And then I, uh, do a tarot reading and a tarot meditation each day as an inner practice. And I set my cards up. Then I go out and do Tai Chi to clear myself and center myself. And after I do Tai Chi, I draw my cards and then meditate on the reading. And then I start checking my email. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say, Paul, there's so much gratitude I hear when you start your day, you know, and most most people get up and they check their email and they don't yeah you know i've 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 been i've been in, in so many places in my life where i was in so much pain and i've been so close to death so many times and i've i've done about 400 shamanic ceremonies with medicines uh-huh. where i've literally died and gone way beyond what the ego can even conceive of and I've helped many people with very deep traumas. And so I, I realized that there is a miracle at play in my life. The fact that I'm even here after having had so many motorcycle racing accidents, stock car racing accidents, parachuting accidents, it's as though I know Great Spirit wants me to be here because I've, I've given great spirit, a million opportunities to just take me away and put me back in the ocean of emptiness. And so I've learned that that gratitude gives me the strength to know that behind every cloud of gray is a silver lining. And if I just stick to my heart and 
acknowledge where I've been loved and, and being loved, I can make it through pretty much anything. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Um, last question. If you could have dinner with anyone, mm -hmm. I mean, you've read so many books, you've had so many mentors, like it's incredible. If you could have dinner with any of them, who would it be? Do you think? And why? Oh, well, it's hard because there's a lot of them, but you know, um, it's very tricky. Uh, I think, you know, there's a lot on that list, but I would probably, I would probably want to have dinner with Carl Jung. Okay. I had an interesting experience one time, a buddy of mine in Toronto, who's a very successful man for my birthday, bought me an astrology reading from a very famous astrologer who does a lot of astrology work for movie stars and famous people and is very kind of recognized for his astrology work. And when I showed up to get my reading, he looked at me and he said, you know, your reading's almost identical to two very famous people. And I said, really, who are they? He said, Carl Jung and Madonna. And I said, that's mind blowing because I absolutely love Madonna. I'd love to have sex with her. And two, I've studied Carl Jung for years and I absolutely have tremendous reverence for him. So it turns out that our birth charts, he showed me, he actually had copies of their birth charts. When you laid my chart over theirs, they were almost identical. And so it seems that the stars work through us. And I've studied a lot of Carl Jung's work. Um, and I tell you what, that's one man who really did the work to not just be an intellectual left brainer. He connected both halves of his brain. He pioneered art therapy. He developed depth psychology. He did, you know, he developed the Myers-Briggs personality test. I mean, the guy was just, he's so deep. It's unbelievable. Um, so I, I don't think he's more evolved than say an Itzhak Bentov or a Rudolf Steiner, but I feel such an affinity with him that I would love to just hug him, kiss him and say, thank you, because you gave me so many tools to help other people live better that I, I would actually offer him a foot massage. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And uh, with everything we've covered today, is there anything you'd like, to leave our listeners to ponder on? Well, I think we've done that quite well. I think you've done it very well. Um, I would say that the longest journey most people ever have to take is only a foot long and it's from their head to their heart. And whenever you're feeling frustrated, angry, upset, confused, just ask this question what would love do now? Mm -hmm. And if you answer that honestly, you'll always be okay. And that's a beautiful place to end it. I couldn't agree more, Paul. If anyone wants to find out more about you, your work, you've got a podcast as well. Yes. I'm aware. Uh, well, my institute is chekinstitute.com and there's loads of stuff there my YouTube channel where I have over 500 videos on a wide variety of topics is youtube.com forward slash Paul C H E K live Paul check live. Um, my podcast is living Four D number four capital D with Paul check. And there's lots of great interviews on there. Um, and my blog is Paul checks blog.com. So, there's enough to keep people reading and listening and studying for about 30 years there. There is, there is. And, it's, and I highly recommend anyone listening to go and check it out, which I'm sure if they've listened to this podcast all the way through, Paul, they'll be, they'll be hungry for more. I don't doubt it. Well, they, they've either signed me up on the prayer list so I don't burn in hell or they've put me up as a nutcase or they're interested and I've been through all of those. So it's okay. <laughs> well Paul look thank you so much for your time today and thank you for everything you do and thank you for coming on my show 
Uh, it was truly awesome speaking to you, and uh, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very grateful that you took the time and interest to share with me and I, that I could share with your listeners, and it was lovely to share with your wife. So uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Paul.